the big picture is El Salvador becomes Bitcoin country. You want people moving here. Uh, you want to be able to make Bitcoin maximalism um, safe, you know, to push it forward, to, to keep everything away from that might not be Bitcoin maximalism. And so you create that citadel, that Bitcoin Maximus yeah. Citadel Nation, Bitcoin country. We're going to uh, make it so that you are finally able to enjoy freedom, economic freedom. I think El Salvador is now the one, the single, only indispensable, unique country on planet Earth that the world needs now. And we are live here from Bitcoin Beach with the one and only Max Kaiser. Been trying to get him on here forever, but uh, finally got him here in the studio. And I'm going to try to match his youth and vigor and enthusiasm today. But I, I'm yeah, sure I will not be. Able, I will not be able are to keep up. Are you a boomer? Up. Are you an Xer? I, Mike I, Peterson, the X Gen I, X. I, I, I am an Xer, but I don't have nearly the energy that you have. Speaking so. of Gen X, I had yeah, Stacy on here a few weeks ago. I. I think she had 3,000 views. I'm going to crush that number uh, okay, with this show. Well. We're going to get to 20,000 views. <laughs> I can feel it. I can feel it in the air. That was my first dun, question dun. was uh, how you managed to <laughs> marry above yourself uh, like I did. That's that's my my biggest feat in life is I married somebody much better than I deserve. And, I'll tell you. And, and I'm going to say I think the same for you, Max. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, how how did you land, Stacy? Where did you guys meet? I'm curious as to what that story Stacey's is. Stacy's a leg man. A leg woman. A leg she woman. Likes, she likes legs. So obviously, when, you know, <laughs> she took one look at these legs and she she instantly. Hello, are you still there? She instantly <laughs> fell in love, and uh, so that's that's the secret there. You know, uh, we met in the south of France. I was a pole dancer uh, in Monaco for a while, and I did some striptease work. And she came in the club one night, she saw my legs and we went out for coffee. And then that just went on now for 20 years. It's incredible. We've never, we're on our, still on our first date, Mike. It's a, we just, we, we just keep going and going and going. Uh, Stacy's celebrating her birthday in El Zante this weekend. 33? 34? Yeah, she's 30, 34, 34, I think. Okay. And um, I, I, every day, I, my love grows for Stacy. That she's a very mysterious individual. That you, no matter how much you think you know her, there's always more to know and more to discover. And it's, uh, it's. I, I think we'll go another twenty or thirty years. That has been uh, one of the things I've enjoyed the most about getting to know you guys over the last year is, is watching you guys in your relationship. You can, you know, a lot of times people when they're in front of the public or whatever, they're one way, but you can tell behind the scenes there's lots of tension and there's not real love or friendship there. But with you guys, you can tell you just genuinely enjoy hanging out with each other. And yeah, so you know, unfortunately, we have to take a break from our personal life making love to uh, do podcasts <laughs> and TV appearances. Well, you know, we'll, that's we'll, tr thing. we'll try to get you if, out if of here before too long. there wasn't any podcast, we would just be in, in, a limbs akimbo, <laughs> you know, just enjoying each other's presence on this planet. Mike, no, hello, heard this on? Hey, yeah. dude. <laughs> Hey, it, congratulations on this podcast. It's really, you know, doing great. Oh, it's been it's been a blast. I, I love being able to delve into issues with people and, you know, not just touch the surface, but but really right. dig in. And, yeah. and it's it's fun. It's fun having it was a blast having Stacy on here. Oh, yeah. Um, obviously, this is something I'm passionate about. And so to be able to kind of sit down in a longer format for me is I can't think of anything. Speaking of long more. formats, did you see me on Tucker Carlson show? I did. Yeah, full 60 I did. Minutes. That was Fox News. That was yeah, that's uh, a big show. But like 30 million viewers. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. No. Uh, Some I, people say I, it was the I best. Actually, I really love Tucker Carlson. So I was I, I feel honored that I have the same guest that he has. I, I so, think uh, that's that needs to be acknowledged. <laughs> um, you know, people say it's the best orange pilling of anyone on any mainstream media outlet. I mean, that not me. That's not me yeah, saying yeah, yeah. that's an anonymous person that I'm quoting that I'm just made up on the spot <laughs> to make it sound like somebody other than myself is saying that. But the point is. Who would you have on Joe Rogan trying to orange pill Joe Rogan, Mike Peterson? Uh, we, we've, we've already nominated you. You were trying to defer to someone yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. So, I think Jack uh, Mahler should do it because he's born out of Bitcoin. His mom is Bitcoin mom. He's got a really successful company. He could, he really, I think, would be the perfect guy to talk to Joe Rogan. I think Michael Saylor and myself are kind of like too old. We're kind of like boomers almost. 
And uh, I think uh, the other choice is, uh, I think Safe Dina Moose is a, he's an academic, certainly. Yeah. And a, a, I think that might be overly academic for Joe Rogan. Uh, but I, I think uh, my vote is Jack Mahler. So, Jack, I vote for you to get on Joe Rogan, to get your people to call his people. So, so somebody out there in the space has to have connections with Rogan. So let's make this happen. Well, why is Rogan just seemingly anti-Bitcoin? You know, he doesn't want it. It seems like he's re, re, some people. It is just anathema to their natural way of thinking. And I mean, he had Andreas Santanopoulos on a couple of times years ago. And Andreas, you know, is a, is a great guy. Yeah. He's a good, he orange pilled. He's one of the most influential orange pilling Bitcoin people in the history of Bitcoin. I mean, if you go back, there's him, there's Trace Mayer, who was incredibly influential. He's kind of like pre Michael Saylor. Everything Michael Saylor says about Bitcoin being an asset class, Trace Mayer said in 2010, you know, he was buying Bitcoin at 10 cents. Then he kind of fell off the face of the earth. Um, so um, that's that just um, you have to go with what like Donald Rumsfeld said, you go to war with the army you have. What does that quote have to do with what I just said? Probably not much. But I love making these kinds of quotes in these podcasts because people say, wow, that's incredible. And then I see him recut and repaste it. And there's like, this is an amazing quote, apropos of nothing and taken totally out of context. But that's how influencers work. We don't actually make sense, Michael. We just just spew. But our spew is gorgeous. It's a gorgeous spew. You're, you're saying all the quiet part out loud. So, uh, you're, you're, I brought you this for your show, the nice prop. Uh, this, of course, is very famous. Uh, I saw Stacey Cringe over there because I just made a banging noise and the producer and her like went, oh, my God, I can't believe he made that fucking noise. Uh, but anyway, here it is, the uh, uh, famous grenade that I brought to visit with the president, Najib Bukele, uh, another highlight in past year for me. Uh, I got a chance to sit down with the president for five hours, talk Bitcoin mostly. And um, there's some great shots of him with these grenades. And I think these grenades speak to the idea of a nonviolent revolution that is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a revolution, but it's a revolution that doesn't require violence. Um, and it is in many, it has all attributes from there. Yeah. I mean, that's the rabbit hole that is Bitcoin. So I'll throw it back to you, Michael, because no, I, I, mean, it, I, I totally agree. <laughs> It'll probably be the, the, the one time in history where we see a real shift in power and wealth but there's not a you know shooting war that or a violent war that's part of that, and so hopefully not. Um, I think the banks, as we're seeing, the banks are yeah. getting very nervous, and the central banks are getting very nervous. The politicians in Washington, like Liz Warren, for example, and others, Chuck Schumer, they're getting they're starting to realize that this Bitcoin is very disruptive to the entire status quo, the entire system, and now they're trying to figure out how to fight back. You know, they're ten years too late. Their way, they're not going to succeed, but they're, they'll they will resort uh, to everything. Uh, they'll they'll stop at nothing and and resort to anything to try to stop the Bitcoin revolution. And they could do a lot of really silly things and dumb things, and a yeah. lot of people could get hurt. Um, I'm hoping that people like Senator Lummis uh, and others in the system who are talking about Bitcoin get are more successful and, and get people in uh, the government to understand Bitcoin more. And uh, as I've been saying now for five years, I think uh, what you're going to see around the world is not governments banning Bitcoin, but governments getting involved in what I call the global hash war, a concept I introduced five years ago. Uh, where people, uh, countries are going to be trying to compete with each other to mine and hoard Bitcoin. Uh, as the fiat money collapses, as banks collapse, there's really only two choices. That would be gold and Bitcoin. Bitcoin is superior uh, in many, many ways. So uh, I think it's going to take, that's how we get to Bitcoin. Two million yeah. is, is the total collapse of the fiat money world and the re recognition that gold is okay, but Bitcoin is better. No, I think it is the folks like Liz Warren. I mean, she, I do think, actually does get it. She just hates freedom. She hates people having, you know, control over their own lives, and she wants to be able to control them. So I think she understands the potential of Bitcoin. A lot of them are just too stupid. They don't even understand the potential. They see Bitcoin as, you know, something that you speculate on. They don't realize it's a shifting of the, the world financial system and how everything works from the bottom up. But I think she actually gets it, and that's why she's fighting against it so fiercely. But I think Bitcoin's one of those things that once the majority of people are exposed to it, 
they go down the rabbit hole and they become supporters of it. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a uh, technology that has transformative properties and like the printing press with Gutenberg or the electric light, or um, you can name these types of epoch defining technological changes that uh, and now uh, in the case of Bitcoin, what we've seen is the final um, capitulation of money to software. You know, up until Bitcoin, just about every single industry in, in imaginable had become essentially transformed by software. So supermarkets, you know, they're actually software companies. Uh, energy companies are software companies. Uh, software companies are software companies. Uh, you know, everything is driven by data and maximizing data. Yield management on an airline, that's a software product. That's an algorithm. So all corporations defer to algorithms and software and computer technology. And so this is what drives the entire economy for all these industries. And that started in the 1970s and just advanced every year since then. The one lagging part of the economy that had yet to capitulate to software would be money. So money itself was still being, and banks were still a 300 year old paradigm. And so Bitcoin comes around and it takes money into now a 300 year paradigm shift. So that's a huge shift to go from the way the banks were when the Bank of England was created in, uh, I believe, 1692 uh, to suddenly in the 2009, you had this leap, had a quantum leap from the way things were done in 1692 to something new. Here we are in 2009. And that quantum leap, some people got it. Mostly the people who got it initially were people who whose brains were adept at finessing very abstract concept. So hackers and drug users, I would be put into that uh, category. And um, those who were uh, on the fringe of society, typically the outcasts of society who are forced to operate on the margins and can look at things abstractly. And that's why people like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Amir Taki, uh, who we met back in 2011. Uh, if Fortune magazine ran a cover story on Amir that this guy is going to be a, the first Bitcoin billionaire, uh, he had a conference in Prague in 2011. Stacy and I went to that conference. It was the first real Bitcoin conference. Um, he uh, was somebody who's said that he thought sleep was uh, an, uh, was a was a construct, an unnatural construct, a societal really? construct that he didn't need to sleep. Uh, later it came out that he had a bit of an amphetamine problem, but <laughs> nevertheless, um, he went to fight ISIS, uh, in the middle East for a while. I mean, these are people whom for whom Bitcoin represented a, a chance to experiment and the people who experiment on the fringes of society end up coming across ideas and concepts that when they make it to the mainstream of society, transform society. So the alchemists, you know, the yeah. alchemists of the Middle Ages were doing things and on themselves, you know, let's see if I swallow mercury, what happens? You know, the alchemists were absolutely insane many times in many cases. And um, so you had uh, this type of mentality with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is very much in the tradition of alchemists. Instead of trying to turn lead into gold, you're turning digits into or encryption into the, 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 the most advanced form and perfect, what do we call perfect money? Yeah. Solving and, all the issues that need to be solved with the best money in the world. Yeah, exactly. And so now here we are in 2023 and it's it's knocking on the door of the central banks and uh, Karsten's at the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland is now fully on, on alert that uh, things are, are changing, things are coming, you know, again, using the Middle Ages when uh, Copernicus uh, said that it's actually the sun at the center of the solar system and not Earth. Uh, that's such a, a, a paradigm shifting, mind blowing concept for the church at that time. Uh, he's, he was considered a heretic and uh, Galileo. Similarly, these are her heretical concepts that would out of favor with the centralized, highly centralized, highly dogmatic uh, church of that time in the Middle Ages. And but nevertheless, they were right and transformative advances in society took place and the church's uh, power uh, center diminished uh, and we gave way to things like the renaissance and then the enlightenment you know stacy often talks about bitcoin as being enlightenment 2.0 uh, president bukele as being the new uh, medici uh, that he's and and uh, el salvador is the new florence it's attracting all the talent it's attracting all the commerce it's attracting all the artists and uh, so far that 
a hypothesis uh, has been proven correct every single week. You read in the in the every week there's a story. Uh, for example, with Bukele uh, was criticized by the leader in Colombia, uh, and a day later there was a poll in, by in the in Colombia saying not like everyone in Colombia loves Bukele yeah. and you should disappear. You know we want <laughs> we want Bukele. So not so it just drew attention to what's happening here, and uh, the the president of Colombia suddenly looked like. Uh, Again, using one of uh, Stacy's famous quotes, that he had a micro penis. I mean, I think that's what she uh, she's famous for that meme. She doesn't use it that often um, now, but uh, back in the day, uh, this is a, a meme that uh, gained a lot of traction, and this would be appropriate in this case, describing. Uh, I think his name is uh, Petro, maybe or Pedro um, yeah, over I think there. Yeah, it's Petro. Petro. So, yeah. So uh, yeah, Petro in, in Colombia. So. Um, that's again the alchemical property of bitcoin it creates spontaneous order and interestingly enough it also creates spontaneous chaos so i think uh, i always ask the question on twitter is bitcoin causing the chaos or is is it is it reacting to the chaos or is it causing the chaos and i think the answer is both it yeah does, no causes i agree chaos and it uh it it reacts to chaos and uh we're in a very very chaotic period, uh, similar to other previous chaotic periods in history. And uh, it it's similar in ways, but it's also very different because Bitcoin is a very different situation. And it forces people to dig down into their own self and understand who they are. I think it's Bitcoin is a mirror. And if you're somebody like Sam Bankman Freed, you look in the mirror of Bitcoin and you see a shyster, a kleptomaniac, a um, a criminal and, and you go and you lean into that yeah. and you became a bigger criminal than he would have been had Bitcoin not existed because it revealed the inner criminality in his soul and he, and it forced him to act out and then be eviscerated by the presence of Bitcoin. If you're somebody like President Bukele, for example, you look at Bitcoin mirror and, and you say, you know what, this country, El Salvador is actually, it's a $60 billion economy. It's it's a 10 to 20 percent growing economy. It's a tourist destination. It's uh, it's it's it, it brought out what was already great. Yeah. And it brought it out to now running with it because it's the mirror. It's the magic mirror. Bitcoin. No, and I think especially in the case of El Salvador, it really will unleash the potential because that's something that's always I've wrestled with is why isn't El Salvador uh, more economically powerful. Why haven't they done more? The people here are incredibly hardworking, uh, amazingly intelligent, and have been held back by the system. So I do think the what adoption system? of Bitcoin. You mean the system being colonialism? The system is colonialism. That they've been held back by the not even so much uh, colonialism, civil war, just the, the civil the, war, the civil, which is a proxy yeah. war for years between uh, the U.S. and essentially Russia, and then uh, held down by the gangs that were exported to this country from the United States. So they had 50 years of oppression from the outside. That's not that's not systemically uh, deficiency. Yeah. That's uh, that's outright colonialism and uh, oppression. Uh, before that, they were also, I mean, they have to go back 200 years and you still don't find a period in the life of El Salvador's uh, history where they were free forever, completely for themselves, to work for themselves, and now they are. So this is, again, President Bukele has brought liberation, has brought freedom. Well, and, and, and just being able to level the playing field as far as when it comes to the monetary system. In the past, the U.S. has just always held the upper hand. They made the rules. They always make them so they benefit them the most. And countries like El Salvador really get held down. Not that the, the rules are just negative to them, but a lot of times companies won't do business here because they're worried about the compliance costs are, are higher than the benefit. And so El Salvador's never had a lot of the things we take for granted when it comes to, you know, online finances and those sorts of things. But Bitcoin really levels all that and puts them on the same playing field. Yeah, I think that's that's correct. So, you, you know, just in the past year, you've been here for how long? 10 years, 15 uh, years? We bought our house here, I think, 19 years ago. OK, so yeah, so you've been here 20 years. So obviously you're a guy who would be able to fill in all the blanks for the past 20 years. So I ask you, uh, since Bitcoin was made legal tender and since post COVID, because COVID was uh, a, a year of uh, duress for every every country in the world. So here and now in the past year, we're coming out with a full 12 month fiscal 12 month year in El Salvador post COVID. How would you describe it? 
I mean, it's it's a boom town here. A I mean, boom town. people that want work can find work. It used to be, it was very hard for people to find jobs. Now the biggest complaint I hear from local businesses is, hey, we can't find enough staff to, to staff these positions that we have open. So right, exactly. It's, it's a freaking yeah. boom town. And it, it's not, it, it's obviously not like all high paying jobs. These things have to start from somewhere, but it, it really is a 180 degree difference from where it was 10 years ago. Yeah, well, let's say you're living on the street in San Francisco, uh, shooting smack all day and your government has abandoned you. And now they want to send you off to some country to fight a proxy war. Uh, I'd take my $5 a day or $20 a day job in El Salvador over that any day of the week. Yeah. Right. So um, the U.S. and these other countries in Europe, they're cracking under the pressure of fiat money madness. You know, fiat money breeds violence. Fiat money breeds war. Bitcoin monetizes peace and love. And I explain why that is because it's unconfiscatable. So no matter how much coercion you attempt or violence, you cannot get my Bitcoin. So you have to come at me with something different. You have to come out with something that I want in exchange for my Bitcoin in a peaceful way. So uh, violence and uh, war are demonetized by Bitcoin. So yeah. once again, El Salvador being a small country, really, it doesn't have a a, 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 a um, you know military uh, presence uh, really uh, to match uh, the United States or China. But in this in this world, in this paradigm, in a Bitcoin standard world, that's actually a liability. Think about the U.S. spends now. $1.5 trillion a year on the Pentagon to defend the US dollar. Well, if the US dollar is no longer world reserve currency and it's being inflated away to zero, you're, just, you're still spending $1.5 trillion to defend this absolute worthless piece of paper. And that's uh, about half of all the tax receipts you collect in the United States. So half of all the tax receipts collected go into defending the US dollar visa via the Pentagon, and all that is completely becoming worthless anyway. And in the mess comes us, the best, and the brightest, and the smartest are going to be like, I'm going to go to El Salvador. Yeah. I can get a flat there, reasonable price. I got, I'm, I'm a nomad. I'm a digital nomad. I got good internet connection. I, I got a, a city in San Salvador. It looks like Beverly Hills. You know, you got restaurants, you got clubs, you got uh, you know, hipsters. It's all happening. And the buildings are going up like weeds. And the El Zante Beach is uh, the, one of the best surfing beaches in the world. Max and Stacy will meet you at the airport and personally guide you into the city. Uh, that's not actually true, Michael. <laughs> I, just, I made that up. Please don't contact me and ask me to do that. I will not do that. But nevertheless, my point being that El Salvador is well positioned in the world today that's crumbling under the weight of fiat money insanity. Yeah. I want, I want to dive into stuff in El Salvador, but before that, I want to find out the very important question. Is Tucker thoroughly orange pilled at this time? Like, is he, is, is he on board? Is he, uh, did he see the light? I think Tucker is a guy, is a journalist who's not afraid to allow the facts on the ground to shape his view of the world. He's not like somebody on CNBC, on MSNBC or other Fox journalists who have a point of view and an agenda. And no matter what the news is and no matter what the guest is, they always interpret it in a way that supports their point of view, their bias. I mean, journalism ideally is without bias. And when you go to journal, journalism school, it's about teaching journalists how to shed bias. How do you get rid of bias? And how do you deal with bias? How do you incorporate bias? Because it's very, it's impossible not to have a bias. Yeah. So you have to, as a journalist, if you go to journalism school and famous journalists write about this, like Edward R. Murrow or other journalists, you know, they talk about how they deal with their bias and how they um, are able to write and and try to overcome the bias that's impossible to overcome but now we have a now it seems like they don't even pretend to, to no, try to do it they, 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 they lean the into bias. it they, they feature the yeah. bias the bias is who they are you know then you have these shouting matches between these two camps two corporations two two divisions of the same corporation uh, the left and the right, who all work for the same, you know, megalopolis, uh, are doing professional wrestling uh, on TV and calling that news. Now, Tucker Carlson is somebody who's more in the tradition of a journalist who's who comes to the interview knowing that they have a bias in some way and listens. This is the thing about Tucker Carlson when I was with him and he's doing the interview is that I could tell that by the questions he was asking that he was actually listening to what I was saying, able to kind of match it against what he already knew and then come back with a question. So I think that because he's a smart guy, I think that myself and of course, Michael Saylor was on, 
uh, as well. I think that he's well on his way to being orange pilled. And then when you see the collapse of the fiat money world going on around him, he's also very sensitive to that and can say, well, those guys were right. If you if you look at my interview I did with him, and that's now six months ago, a lot of the things I said in that interview are now just happening and coming true today. So yes, I am clairvoyant. Yes, I do come from the future. Yes, I, I am possibly uh, immortal. That's true. I understand that. And I live with that on a daily basis. And my wife, Stacy, reminds me almost every hour that that's not true. However, the fact is what I said on that show has come to fruition. Uh, once again, I was right. Or as President Bukele said recently, Max is always right. End quote. I mean, it's coming right from the president's mouth. OK, <laughs> so I mean, what are we going to well, why are we debating? Max is always right. Just just understand that. I think we have a picture of you celebrating uh, your birthday with the president. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, which you were supposed to be celebrating with us. What? We came we came in the San this Salvador really behind the to, scenes. to no. go to dinner what? with you. And we show up and Stacy's there, la, la, but you're not there. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Yeah. And I was like, well, what, what the <laughs> heck? We just drove an hour to come celebrate with Max. He's like, oh. The president called and, uh, you know, he's more important than you guys. Did so. you feel good about your chance to serve <laughs> the president by allowing me by, to by, go and have my birthday cake with the president? Did you feel uplifted by that? Your patriotic duty? I did. I did. We no, actually we tried know. We tried to order you some key lime pie there because I heard that was your your favorite. But yeah, they were like they were out of the key lime pie. So that's uh, why ultimately I didn't go. Yeah. I mean, a president can wait. The key lime pie was important. It wasn't on offer. So I said. Fuck it, I'm going to see the president. Uh, but this was something that was talked about for a few days beforehand, and it wasn't clear until a few minutes, actually an hour before uh, I got the call, like, yeah, come on over uh, to, to his house. As, 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 and, and we ended up spending about five hours together. He, you know, uh, he, he's a bit of a, a, a night owl. He likes to stay up and... Um, and, and, and troll people on Twitter and troll people on t Twitter, you know, he's, so uh, that that's that's what happened. I apologize <laughs> uh, for uh, this incident, as you've described it, and uh, I will endeavor to make it up to you. I, I'm here, aren't I? I mean, I'm here right now and I'm talking oh, to you. That, that's OK. Podcast. We we uh, it's going to be the we, most we were viewed, there to hang out with Stacey anyway. So. Viewed podcast on Bitcoin live at Bitcoin Beach ever. Well, is this one? It's going to be right. like smoke everything else that's come out before it. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. So you are one of the OGs in Bitcoin by far. Nobody would dispute that. The, the people that love you, the people that hate you, everybody knows you've been around from the, the beginning. A lot of the Bitcoiners that were there when you were kind of starting off in this space have disappeared, kind of melted into the... The shadows, I think they're, they've cashed in their Bitcoin or living like a quiet life without any of the, the stresses of being in the public. What what motivates you to kind of stay in the space, to be out there, to be helping promote what's happening in El Salvador, doing all these things at this stage in your life? Well, a couple of things. So a lot of the early Bitcoiners, a lot of them went rogue, like a Roger Ver, for example, who forked off and created another altcoin. Or, or um, uh, you know, the um, Craig, I won't say the whole the whole name because he's, he's kind of a litigious nightmare. <laughs> but uh, I think people know who I'm talking about. You know, they decided that they were bigger than Bitcoin. And that's Bitcoin susses out people who are egomaniacs uh, versus the people who are more humble. You know, you have to be humble because Bitcoin, the volatility keeps you humble. Right. We've had six, I think, down down moves of 80 or 90 percent. And to be able to get through those requires humility. You have to just like suck it up and keep dollar cost averaging at. Swanbitcoin.com forward slash max. Get ten dollars free Bitcoin at. The, and shout um, out to Swan. They're going <laughs> to they're going to do a Swan house here in El Zante. That's the plan that yes. this next year that so. Yeah, We're well, Swan, to that. you know, they they have Bitcoin maximalists and uh, Corey uh, Clipston was really, I think, the most vocal and visible guy to call out the Celsius uh, problems before they happened. And the other staking claims in the Ethereum, you know, Ethereum is garbage. And, you know, he was early and he's very vocal about making saying these things. And that's all been proven to be correct. Um, I think that El Salvador 
uh, again, uh, has benefited by Bitcoin maximalism because they avoided entirely all the problems of the past a year that's happened in all these coins blowing up. And now we see another wave of counterparty risk and all these counterparty banks blowing up, Silicon Valley Bank blowing up because Again, it's a magic mirror. You know, Silicon Valley and Dries and Horowitz, those guys are not Bitcoiners. They're not Bitcoin maximalists. They're scammers. They're charlatans. And they looked at Bitcoin and they said, we can create something similar to Bitcoin and sell it to suckers and make a bunch, a quick buck. And now their karmic wheel is crushing them as it should be. And if they get destroyed and the banks go under and there's a huge crash and the economy blows up, so be it. You know, that's the way, if that's the way they want to play it, that's the way we want to play it. We got our private keys. We got our Bitcoin. We're sitting here. And if you guys want to blow everything up to smithereens, you want to start all over again from the Stone Age, you know, we're ready. You know, it's up to you. Well, it's funny because, you know, all the predictions were that, in fact, I read an article today talking about how uh, El Salvador almost bankrupted itself by buying Bitcoin, which is silly because if you look at the number and figures, it's just ludicrous. It's lazy journalism. But El no, Salvador they, they, actually paid back their bonds early, saved a bunch of money on doing that and are in a stronger position ever. They have one of the strongest growing economies in the world. And we have banks like uh, Silicon Valley Bank in the U.S. The, that are blowing up while El Salvador is continues to move forward. So right. or you it's have so all ironic. These, you have all these coins that were seeking the bit license in New York and getting licenses and doing everything by the book, crossing the T's and dotting the I's and, and playing with the regulators. And you had, and, and then you have Tether, which said basically fuck you to everybody. And now Tether is the only uh, man, last man standing because they don't have fractional reserve. They're fully backed. They uh, have a product that's the first, the biggest, the most used. And all these other stable coins like Circle. You know, I was on uh, a podcast three months ago. I said, look, Circle's going to blow up. Uh, the counterparty risk is enormous. Their business model of paying people to use the product is unsustainable. And uh, they're crooks. They're charlatans. It's going to blow up. And now that's exactly what's happening. So, again, uh, Bitcoin is the master kind of revealer of the truth. It is the truth. It's the truth machine. I mean, this goes back seven or eight years, Michael. I think that The Economist magazine had a cover story that said Bitcoin, the truth machine. I mean, that was a very profound statement at that time. And I don't think hardly anybody understood what exactly the truth machine means. And now we know what it means. It means if you're a crooked bank like Silicon Valley Bank, you're going to get destroyed. You're going to get crushed under the wheel of Bitcoin. If you're a big fat loser like Karstens at the Bank of International Settlements, you're going to get destroyed by Bitcoin. No matter how much power you think you have, you don't have a any power. You know, you need to get a real job selling yeah. hot dogs somewhere or go to like, a, <laughs> you know, uh, Weight Watchers Anonymous and lose 500 pounds and join the living. You know, this guy is a walking heart attack. Uh, we don't need these kind of. He, he is like the meme for big banks. He I is. Mean, He's it, like the like, caricature uh, of a big, fat, yeah. crooked banker. OK, and uh, we don't need these kind of uh, jackasses in the world. You know, they should just uh, quietly disappear because they're just mucking things up. Yeah. There's a bad look for humanity. You know, if the aliens come looking for our Bitcoin, uh, Karstens is the guy they'll seek out first. They'll feed the entire spaceship on the, his carcass to get a quick meal. Yeah. Then they'll come looking for us for our Bitcoin. And we'll be like, no, we're not giving you your private keys. Aliens go back to your parallel dimensions. We got our Bitcoin. Fuck you, aliens. <laughs> What? So, <laughs> Hello? Am I going too fast? I can talk slower. I mean, what's up with this podcast? So this guy says, come on down and do a podcast and he falls asleep. I mean, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep up with you. I'm trying. I told you I was going to have trouble it. keeping I'm, up with you. So I'm going to got to blow things up. That's it. I'm, I'm pulling the pin. Yeah. This whole thing's going to smithereens. So, so going back to the question, oh, the, uh, the original question of what what has kept you wanting to be like oh publicly involved and out here speaking for Bitcoin, where a lot, I, I know a lot of people have gone off and done their own scam projects. There's been other legitimate Bitcoiners that have just kind of decided, hey, I'm, I'm tired of all the grief. And, you know, there's uh, anytime you try to do something good, people are always going to try to punish you for it. So a lot of them have said enough of it and have kind of, you know, gone off to live their quiet okay, lives. Okay, I get but, the question. But you're out I get here it. still fighting for it. I get the question already, them. okay? Can I answer it? Jesus, man, you're whinging on there. I mean, I get the, what the question is. So, Michael, let me answer the question. So, uh, the OG Bitcoin in me, of course, it goes back to a fundamental underlying hatred of banks and Jamie Dimon and Lloyd Blankfein and Goldman Sachs. And Bitcoin is really the, 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 the bank killer. You know, it gets rid of these guys and I detest them. And I worked on Wall Street. And, and why, why do you detest them? Like you had a history, you worked in that sector. So that's right. And when you work on Wall Street, it's like people who work at um, slaughterhouses become vegetarians. 
right? When you see how the, the meat gets slaughtered and you see the process of industrial farming of chickens and cows and you see the steroids and you see people poking ho holes in cows to let the gas out from all the, all, the, all the things that they're injecting into the cows and how disgusting the whole industry is, you become a vegetarian, right? So a lot of times if you work on Wall Street and you see how things are done, you kind of, you know, turn into a whistleblower and you're like, wait a minute, like I said, again, on this Tucker Carlson show, I mentioned that, that in the pension industry, it's a toxic waste dump for Wall Street. Wall Street wraps losing trades and busted trades and no and, and losses and they package it up and they dump it in pension accounts for teachers and hospital workers and things like that. And it's, it's incredibly um, cruel. I mean, Wall Street is a very cruel industry made up of craven, cruel people who are bankrupting anybody who's not uh, on their speed dial list, who they are doing insider trading with. Okay. And, and so I detest the fact that this is going on in a way that is undermining our society in a fundamental way. And we see the results. The economy is crashing. The cities are collapsing. Uh, and this is, this is a story we've been covering um, really since that I've been talking about for years. When I met Stacy in 2003, it's something we talked, we were talking about right away because I was reading the Financial Times. You know, we met in the south of France and I was reading the newspaper and, you know, we were hanging out and enjoying each other's company. And I'd be like, you know, I look on this front page of the Financial Times, you see this story about collateralized debt obligations being sold from this institution to another. I predict that in two weeks, we're going to have a follow up story saying that they had to mark down those assets by 20 percent. No one knew why. And that it's something that they're going to need a bailout for. And then two weeks later, sure enough, that would happen because it's um, not a hard to predict how these criminals pr act and what the consequences are. And so this got us thinking about Stacy being, having a background in television and storytelling and film, she was fascinated by this and we started to do content around this. And that's how we started to do content. So it was kind of turning my, um, my view of things, which was, um, you know, my, very animated and uh, kind of- uh, No, not you. From uh, like, an, <laughs> like an insider's point of view, like, like revealing stuff and then matching her skills as a storyteller and, and content producer. And this is how we started really. So that's, that's how we got into the content creation business. And uh, initially the, uh, the, the tagline was market finance scandals because we wanted to create a scandal sheet of finance, like um, a tabloid meets the Wall Street Journal because the, like Jamie Dimon becomes the villain, you know, and on Wall Street. They, so this they, was preceding Bitcoin. You were doing this already. That's my point. Okay. Thank you. And then Bitcoin comes around and it's a story that's a, count, a counter story. It's, it's a solution to this And did story. you get it right away? Did you like, I get it or was it, I mean, for me at first I was like, uh, I like it, but it sounds like a Ponzi scheme. What, what was your- Well, I had in 1996, uh, when I was in Los Angeles, I, I started a company called the Hollywood Stock Exchange and we created a virtual currency called the Hollywood Dollar. And I have a patent on a virtual currency, patent number 5950176. And it's a patent for trading virtual currencies with a on a virtual exchange uh, and enables virtual securities with a virtual uh, currency. So that patent uh, was the foundation of that company. We became the most traded exchange in the world by number of trades, but it's a, it's a game, essentially a gaming yeah. uh, platform. Uh, it was sold in 2001 to Cantor Fitzgerald. And they use the principally for the technology that they use to trade derivatives. So derivatives are virtual instruments, and this gives them a way to make a market in a virtual instrument. So I was already aware um, of the virtual currency space. There had there were a lot of digital and virtual currencies in the dot com era. Uh, Beans, I think, was one of them was called. Uh, several others. Uh, the Hollywood dollar was one, um, and then it tagged on to my experience in the 1980s as a stockbroker. And as a stockbroker in the 1980s, it was a period of a lot of innovation and creativity uh, on Wall Street in the 1980s uh, because they came out, uh, they, they were entering into a period of discounting, heavy discounting with Charles Schwab and others. So they had to come up with a lot of new products. And uh, so you saw how financial products were created, uh, how you, and, and you understand that financial, financial products and stocks and bonds and things are, are just colors in, in a, in our crayons in a crayon box that you can create all, all kinds of, of products, right? ETFs yeah. are interesting because you can create 
uh, there are more ETFs than our stocks, stocks yeah. underneath, right? They just, you can create an e all kinds of ETFs and, and things like that. So it's, it's actually, it's a very, it can be a very, very creative environment. You know, I, I started on Wall Street. I was doing stand up comedy in 1982, and I was studying uh, at New York University at the Tisch School of Arts uh, and doing um, film and radio. And like a lot of struggling, uh, you know, comics and actors, you know, you get jobs in New York. Uh, waiter jobs and things like that. So I ended up getting a job at a brokerage firm at Payne Weber on Wall Street as a part-time job just to support my comedy habit. And um, with no desire to go into the finance I had industry. No, I had okay. nothing. I had no knowledge of it. I had no desire of it. Just another part-time gig. Yeah. I, I worked as a uh, usher at Radio City Music Hall. I worked as a proofreader at a rubber stamp factory. Uh, I was I was uh, boxing things in warehouses. I used to do street magic as a teenager in New York. I knew how to do street magic. If things got desperate, I could make I could make three hundred bucks on an afternoon in Times Square if, if it got to that. Um, and so I walked into this into this brokerage firm, and I was immediately smitten. I just fell in love with this whole this whole industry, principally the ticker tape, which in those at that time you know was scrolling on the wall, and you know it's the symbol for the stock and price. And, you know, every single one of those of those ticker entries is a story. You know, if you're a story addict, if you're if you love stories and you love uh, theatrics, if you love drama, if you love things, if you love life, it, it is scrolling by, you know, right there. It's uh, every single tick is a story. And then to get on the phone and be able to tell a story, it's like uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed actually when you start off there, you're, you're a cold, you're cold calling people and people usually die uh, during the cold calling phase of the career because it's most people hate the idea yeah. of calling strangers up for money. But in fact, this was well, the most enjoyable thing I had experienced. In, <laughs> I can picture uh, you loving life, it. Right. So you're just calling people up in the Midwest and just like, <laughs> hey, Jack, it's Max on Wall Street. Who? What? Who the fuck are you? It's like, look, Jack, I know you're you know, this is coming as a bit of a surprise, but I had to call you. Uh, Payne Weber, as you know, you've seen the ads on TV. Um, I got your name um, from, you know, name some famous guy in town. You just look it up like a doctor or a lawyer who's mm -hmm. big there. You say, you know, uh, Andrew, whomever. He, oh, you know Andrew? Yeah, yeah, I do business with him. So anyway, look, Jack, I wanted to tell you about this particular recommendation that we're just making, right? So. It's really cool. You know, it's fascinating to be able to just dive into somebody's life and fuck with their brain over the phone for 20 minutes. It's like, that's pretty fascinating stuff. And then they give you an order at the end and you're making like, I was at, as a proofreader at a rubber stamp factory, I was making, I think $6,000 $6, a year. And so my first year on Wall Street, it was a very different story. And, um, and of course, if you're in your 20s and you're in New York and suddenly you're flush with cash. There's no end to the amount of fun you can have. It's a very fun place if you are got a lot so of money. So how long was it before you started seeing the, the depravity in it and the, the havoc that it was? Uh, I think the crash of 87 kind okay. of put a damper on things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what? So you lived through the crash. It was the biggest percent crash in Wall Street history. Uh, it was a wake up call to, to use a, an overused cliche, but uh, nevertheless, it was. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like think about things a little bit. Uh, so two years after the crash, I left. I went to Paris, uh, kind of semi retired, and I lived there for five years and just basically kicking back and enjoying Europe and, and France and uh, didn't really. I had to save a bunch of money. Um, and then I met Alec Baldwin who was in town with his wife, Kim Basinger. Uh, she was making a movie called Pret a Porte for Robert Altman. And Alec, who I knew from NYU, he was at the acting school at NYU. That's how I knew him. We used to do comedy together at clubs. And um, we were hanging out while his wife was making this movie. And then I, I told him about a script idea I had um, for him and his brother, Billy. And he said, oh, that's awesome, I like it. And he got on the phone with Harvey Weinstein. And five minutes later, that treatment for that script was sold uh, for a nice sum of money. And um, two weeks later, I was in Los Angeles making this making this movie, uh, which which got went into turnaround. It was never made. But I hooked up with my uh, buddy from Wall Street, Michael Burns. Uh, we started the Hollywood Stock Exchange and then we sold it to uh, Cantor Fitzgerald. He went on to he's now the vice chairman of Lionsgate Films, uh, which has become a big 
uh, player in yeah. Hollywood. Um, I saw, I went back to France after that. I said, fuck it, I'm going back to France, uh, back into retirement. And then in 2000, and then in 2003, I met Stacy. really just randomly. Uh, she w- we, uh, sh- I walked into what was then called an internet cafe. They had them at that time. <laughs> it was called Chez Net in Villefranche-sur-Mer on the, in the Côte d'Azur between Nice and Monaco. Mm-hmm. And I walked in and I, I felt her presence really before I even saw her. I just, the air was crackling. There was something there. And the, the guy who was running it said, oh, Max, meet Stacy. She's a writer. She's a writer too. And she had her back to me. And I looked over and I saw, oh, okay, Stacy. And that, that crackling sensation in the air got like a Geiger counter. It went, something was, was bubbling. And then she turned around and then she smiled. And then did, I knew, she, did she feel that crackling too? Or yeah, absolutely was not. She still hasn't felt it. <laughs> she's still, she, she's still trying to like get rid of me. You know, I won't go away. Yeah. I just, but I knew at that moment that it was like, okay, this is the woman I'm going to be spending the rest of my life with. Um, so, you know, uh, we, that's how we got started. So that was February 13th, 2013. A day before Valentine's Day. Okay. So you were already in the Bitcoin space before you met Stacy. Well, that was 2003, Michael. So I don't know if you're following along. Oh, I thought you said Bitcoin, 13. Bitcoin, what? Did I? Yeah. I apologize. 2003. Okay. 2003. Okay. I, 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 I thank you for making that correction. So yes, 2003. Okay. Right. So then uh, that's when we met and we were, we were hung out in the Villefranche for a couple of years. Then uh, we, we decided, you know, maybe we should do something with our lives other than hanging out with each other. So uh, we, we, we embarked on this content creation. Uh, we, we started making films uh, for Al, Al Jazeera English. We made some films for them. We, we formed a partnership with uh, the Associated Press. Okay. So we, we, we moved to Paris uh, and um, I, I was called in to do a lot of talking head spots for, uh, about the economy for different uh, networks. And I, I suggested to them that they do their own show and just sell it to these other networks. So that's how we kind of got started. Also, um, we got we're in touch with uh, somebody who was uh, writing some a business, a, a magazine in um, London called The Private Eye, which is a very famous magazine. And they contacted us about contributing some ideas for a story they were working on. Uh, it, this turned out to for us doing some film, some short films for Al Jazeera English. But we were and all, all this. You were living in Paris. At yeah, that time. at the Paris. And we were really living like a, this really interesting life of, you know, international travel, making these films, doing journalism, doing little documentaries and working really. I mean, uh, the Associated Press has always been our producer. They're, they're the producing partner. Like, for example, with RT, which we were there for 13 years, uh, people say, you know, they don't understand that the Associated Press hired us to make content, they then sell it. You know, they, it's, we don't, we never talked to RT. We never talked to Moscow in 13 years, except once during Christmas. And I also, once I got censored by RT because we got a message and they said, tell Max, please don't show his nipple. <laughs> because uh, there was a story on, um, you remember uh, on Fox News, there was a, very, a famous anchor man on Fox News. Uh, I can't remember his name now. But he made he said something derogatory about a, a, a journalist that we knew, and so I ripped my shirt off and I said, you know, bite my nipple, and uh, they 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 cut that out. They they said we don't the, show the nipples. The Kremlin didn't like we that. We don't show nipples on our show. I'll give you another funny story. Is there's a famous clip on uh, you can see it on YouTube where I get into a fight with a guy on stage where he's playing this role of Jamie Dimon, and we get into a fight. And the whole thing is staged, okay? It's a staged fight because they were doing an event that night to, as a kickboxing event. This was going back, I guess, around 2013 or 2014, maybe. Uh, it was a Bitcoin-sponsored kickboxing event. They came on my show, and then the network came. The RT, the network came back to the Associated Press, and they said, "We have to know if that fight was real or fake." And, they, and we said, "Yeah, it's fake." And they said, "Okay, we can show it because if it was real, we couldn't show it because we can't show violence." So it was kind of an interesting look into how things are, are made. Uh, I did a show for, uh, well, I did many shows. You yeah. know I mean, we did this for years and years. And but when, a lot when of did, what there. was your first exposure to, to Bitcoin? How did that enter in? And right. That- so um, Stacy got an email from John Matonis 
uh, who is uh, the inventor. I think it's called Hushmail, which is an encrypted mail. Okay. And then he's gotten into, and he became the director of the Bitcoin Foundation. And he 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 contacted Stacy and said he'd like to maybe come on the show. And Stacy said to me, this guy John Matonis, has, he wants to talk about something called Bitcoin. And it sounds like your Hollywood dollar. It sounds like that Hollywood thing you were doing. So he came on. And so that was in 2011 and Bitcoin was one or two or three dollars at that time. And that was our first exposure to it. So, and it, it did, you know, click with me uh, pretty quickly. And um, that, that's how we got started. So we, we were, uh, we were then invited to the, um, the event in Prague and we were invited by Tony Gallippi, who was the founder and CEO of BitPay. And he wanted us to invest in BitPay. And so he wanted us to go to this, conference in Prague. So he said, I'll buy your, your plane ticket to go, uh, and I'll pay you in Bitcoin. So he sent us 800 Bitcoin wow. at that time to buy the tickets yeah. to go to Prague in 2011. And, uh, so, um, not, not quite as much as the, the pizza purchase, <laughs> but, uh, one of well, the most expensive flights out there. <laughs> I guess so. You know, Tony Gallippi, you know, he's an early guy who you don't hear from anymore because he, he is, I think quietly, sitting on a hundred thousand or so and Bitcoin. And, um, I think he's just enjoying life, uh, in, in retirement as it were. So th a lot of people are like that. Yeah. They definitely, uh, are sitting on a hundred thousand or so Bitcoin and they just, they don't really feel a need to mix it up and have to go into the ring and fight all day long. But for me, I still like to do it because it's a way to fight against the bankers. And I like fighting against bankers because, you know, as I said, I was in the banking industry and the thing about fighting the bankering like a Jamie Dimon is that they, they never really hit back. Uh, which is different than, let's say, if you're doing a lot of protest against the energy industry, uh, that's really dangerous. Or the defense industry, that's really dangerous. Um, you know, environmental journalists who go after companies who are polluting, a lot of those journalists get um, disappeared. Uh, they get murdered. Right. But when you go after big banks, they don't care. They don't. There's nothing that you can do to hurt them. They, they will always get a bailout anyway. So this is like, it's, it's fun to be able to just take on these, these giants and just like, not, not have to worry. I, there's not, there's, I hit out on you. There's never any consequences. I think one or two times we, we drifted over into like the energy business and like immediately, like the earth stood still and like lawyers showed up and letters showed up and it's like, who the fuck do you think you are? You can't talk about the energy industry. Who, who the fuck do you think you are? And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going back to the criticizing the banking industry. <laughs> which is what I'm, 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 be, I'm better at that anyway. So did you have uh, any idea when you guys agreed to come to the Bitcoin conference in El Salvador that, yeah. uh, that this would become your future home? Well, the, um, we had speculated for years about which country would make Bitcoin legal tender first. Uh, El Salvador's name didn't pop up. So then at Bitcoin conference in Miami, the announcement was made, Jack Mahler's, and had basically had a relationship with President Bukele, and the announcement was made, they made Bitcoin legal tender. So immediately, like we knew that we had to come here. So we came here in uh, 2021 in November to get, to see what was going on. And um, and and we were pretty well known, I mean, from, from the TV show, especially because the TV show is, is dubbed into Spanish and plays all over the Spanish speaking world, in particular in Central America and South America. Yeah. And we're actually so I, I'm, I've been shocked at what, how big your reach is in Latin America, you know, with with it being an English speaking show. You know, it's dubbed into Spanish. It, and yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the most seen show on RT network in, in any of their five languages. Uh, it, I think it's because you're like a live telenovela. I mean, you're so yeah. dramatic and I think they like that. So. Yeah, it's definitely like one of those <laughs> wrestling matches, you know, and uh, it's a telenovela. We. We have a relationship and people like a lot of the comments are kind of funny. Like you'll read them. And if you go through the Spanish translation, they'll be like, Ooh, Stacy didn't like what Max just said. <laughs> oh, Max, Max, look, Stacy's mad at Max. Right. Like they're like, you know, they're following this type of thing. And, um, so it, it works on a number of different levels. It's informative. It's, um, you know, we've been good at making a lot of calls. Well, you guys are entertaining too. We're very I mean, entertaining like, and we made yeah. a lot of great calls. I mean, Bitcoin was a great call. We got a lot of people into Bitcoin under five bucks and, uh, but not so many in the United States because the United States is like, has a huge bias against yeah. anything that's not produced in the United States. So you have a lot of people in Central America and South America that became Bitcoin millionaires 
when they were buying it for five bucks. And we don't see the, so much of that in the U.S. because the U.S. Uh, was not allowed to see this show because of the geopolitical bias that that prevented that from happening. So um, anyway, they had that huge audience in in that in that part of the world. And so when we came here, people, you know, we were already famous. I mean, you know, people would be that's Max and Stacy yeah. and stop us on the street. So um, we we had already a way to kind of um, start to be able to talk to folks and see, you know, who's doing what. And um, we became convinced after meeting the president, I guess that's when really things started to heat up a little bit. So we we met the president. Um, we met him first at a groundbreaking for uh, in the downtown El Salvador. Uh, they were they're building a new library, et cetera. And um, he was incredibly cordial and you can tell he was a humble guy who was loved by folks, but very, very smart and very aware of everything that's going on. I would say uh, that's one thing about him that I have been really uh, overtaken is just how how granular he is on running the country to like how many you know shovels are needed to get the irrigation project fixed in some remote area to where will the country be in five years? Like yeah. He's got the whole spectrum. He just kind of sees it all. Uh, and he's able to pick to get the most impact for the, the least amount of, let's say, cash, right? For example, like when you make the visa requirements go from 90 days to 180 days or the visa, the tourist visa. Window, Which is a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. It doesn't cost them anything, actually saves them money from headaches right. and tells people, hey, we're open for business. We want foreigners to come right. in and invest and think of the here. genius of that. It's yeah. like he heard, hears about it, thinks about it, right, signs something and the tourist uh, dollars just doubled. Yeah. But that that's the kind of thing that he didn't have to go to a committee. It wasn't bureaucratic. There was no, you know, he just like I, I think this is probably how like a Steve Jobs or somebody like that operates. They can take in huge amounts of information and see in that haystack of information, the the needle that is the actual thing that if I act on this right now will create a much outsized benefit compared to the effort and time I'm going to take to do it. So uh, this is what I, you know, I envision his mode of operation is just like I've got 500,000 decisions to make over the next two or three years. So where do I start? I'm going to start with how to make the biggest impact quickly right now with these decisions and just move my way through this stack of the things that have got to be done. Uh, obviously building this enormous prison and going after the gangs and making and bringing security to the country for the first time ever was something that took, you know, it didn't, didn't happen in year one, right? So, but I'm sure year one, he thought about it and was thinking about how to slot it into where that needed to be done and how to fund it, et cetera. So, um, and every single week, uh, Mike, you know, the president announces something that he's new program that obviously he's been thinking about for a while and planning for a while. It drops, it works. And you're like, it's hard to keep up with the president. I'll tell you, I mean, I, I don't have, I mean, I don't really do shit. I mean, I just sit around on Twitter all day. I actually have nothing to do. So, and I have plenty of time to try to think these things through. And yet I can't keep up with them, you know, and he's running the country. So I, I don't know how he does it. Uh, it's like uh, Elon Musk. How does Elon Musk run three companies or four companies? You know, I have no idea how yeah. he does that. Um, so I just have no idea how he's able to really get all this stuff done. I, I don't, uh, it's not for me to know. I don't need to know. You know, I, I don't know. I don't need to know. I just, you know, I'm here to, we, we try to, the idea, the big picture is El Salvador becomes Bitcoin country. Okay. So what can we do to move it in that direction? And, um, there's a lot of stuff on the, on the plate, a lot of stuff to consider, a lot of stuff to do. And, um, but that's, I think a goal that, is a goal that is a unifying goal. You want people moving here. Uh, you want to be able to make Bitcoin maximalism um, safe, you know, to push it forward, to, to keep everything away from that might not be Bitcoin maximalism. Uh, and, and so you create that citadel, that Bitcoin maximus yeah. citadel nation, Bitcoin country. Uh, so there's just a lot of different ways to do it. And uh, so anyway, we came in that, that year. Then we went back to North Carolina and we were there for a few weeks. And um, 
I think you know you have to have to really you know get into the Stacy story here because she was she really was almost like jumped out of you know off the chair one day and just was like you know we have to go back we have to move there and I'm like yeah that's a great idea what's for lunch she said no 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 you don't get it we have to move to El Salvador we have to move there and I'm like oh, okay uh tell me more I, I think I want to hear this. I'm not sure. Uh, so she was really pushing for this to to move, to make a move, you know, that she... Because she saw the role you guys could play and that there was these exciting things that were happening or she just thought she wanted to live here. Like, what was the motivation behind it? I, I think that she really... the I think the president really just had his... Uh, really um, had an impact on Stacy in a, in a huge way then that um she she saw him as being a once in 500 year phenomenon and that well, he was creating a sovereign masterpiece and um so that's that vision as she I think you could say had that vision so at that point with Kaiser report also uh it had ended so uh, I couldn't make, have the excuse that we can't do it because we have to do the Kaiser report. I didn't have that excuse. I wish I had had that excuse because <laughs> I, I love doing Kaiser report, but I didn't have that, that def I couldn't say that. So I'm like, well, uh, it's nothing like, uh, okay, you know, uh, let's do it. So, um, the, so we moved, you know, we came here and, and we, we- And originally you guys were in El Zante, right? That's yeah, we, yeah, we were in El Zante. I think originally we thought we would spend more time in El Zante, but you know, everything's happening in the city. Yeah. So, so we, now we have a flat in the city and, um, you know, it's, all, you know, Stacy has a skill set that with the Kaiser report, it's not necessarily you know reflective of all the things that she can do. You know, Kaiser report is then television is, it's kind of a narrow set of things that one can do and, and does. And so here, uh, in this environment, there's just a lot di more different things and challenges, um, th th which which are, which is very uh, exciting to do to to, to 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 rise to the occasion, to be challenging, and to be part of something, right? Yeah. So, to be part of something special, to be part of something historic, to be part of something that is um, going to change a lot of people's lives, and also the Salvadoran people are very, very kind and very nice people, and they're very open people, and they're very generous people. And these are the, the people that are going to benefit from this um, the most. And to be able to give, to be part of that community, you know, we, I think it's about 25 family people, people have said we're now part of their family. So now we're, and you know, it's just, we've made friends, a lot, we have more friends in El Salvador than we've ever made in, you know, anywhere else really. Uh, so it's a very warm, warm place. And, um, plus, plus Stacy does all the work and you can just sit back and enjoy all, all the benefits that go along with it. Well, so I, I think that she goes into the meetings and has the office position. You get to do the fun stuff. You know, it's a bit of, uh, oh, not necessarily, uh, <laughs> the situation. Um, you know, we do, it's a continuation in a lot of ways yeah. of the, what we've been doing for a long time. And uh, in terms of taking to the agenda that's being worked on, kind of what, what, what we mostly understand about Bitcoin. So it's still very much about Bitcoin. And we still very much are like the OG, Bitcoin OGs. And um, I mean, Stacy's over at the office. I'm working, I would say, more closely with the finance minister. Uh, so we, you know, the, the, the Zelaya, the finance minister, somebody that I'm working pretty closely with, but it's because it is finance. Um, it's not, it's something that typically has to be kept on the, the lowdown you yeah. know, until, until these things drop. So I wouldn't say I'm, um, but you're going to share with not, us some, some secret things today, no, right? I, I can't do it. I mean, my background's in finance and banking and things like that, but so, you know, the, 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 the there's a lot happening in the finance, the, the, the securities law, for example, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, the big uh, is something that the bonds, I was involved all that with. stuff the that's bonds, in process, right? So this is all something yeah. to, to to focus on. Yeah, and I think I know you guys have gotten uh, some criticism, um, which anytime you try what? to do anything good, there's criticism that uh, inevitably no follows. good deed gets un yeah, un unpunished. Unpunished. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people say think you guys have 
something that you're gaining from this, that you have ulterior motives, that it's <laughs> part of some big, you know, scheme to, I don't even know what, how they think you're making money off of it. But, um, I got some questions on like, how many people are they actually employing and what difference they're making? So how, how would you explain <laughs> to people that can't get the bigger picture? I mean, maybe you can't explain it to them, but I mean, the president obviously sees that, hey, this is somebody that we can harness their connections and their excitement within the Bitcoin space, who aligns with his vision of where he wants to take the country, but that can help and be an asset in promoting the country to other Bitcoiners, getting the word out because of the uh, credibility that you guys have and all the relationships. So he's basically been able to use all those. And I don't say use in like a derogatory sense, but he's able to use all your relationships and the credibility you have to bring in all these people. And that's basically what you guys are providing for free for the country. Yeah, you know, we, we do. We bring in a lot of people. Um, and and uh, I tweeted recently that I'm trying to get 10,000 people to migrate to uh, El Salvador. And I think that's probably the biggest contribution we make. Uh, and as far as uh, the bureaucracy of government goes, um, there's uh, to what to whatever extent we can uh, help out, we can. We don't get remunerated in any way. Uh, I, we don't employ really anybody. Um, so um, I would say it's um, just an, uh, really an act of love. Really, yeah. it comes from a place where we, in our retirement years, I mean, we're basically retired. In, in some, in, to some degree, I, I can say this. I mean, we're not in our twenties anymore. Yeah. I'm 63, uh, so I will be really officially retired in a couple of years. I'll be getting medic Medicare and Social Security. You know, I'm actually an old codger, right? So this is, uh, it, it's, it's not. I'm not in the part of my life where I'm seeking to, uh, to, to, to be like aggregating huge things anymore. I'm, I'm retired, some yeah. kind of. Uh, so. This is more about the fact that this has become the Bitcoin nation, has become the Bitcoin destination. As Bitcoin OGs, we want to live here. Uh, we, we get to meet a lot of people because we're famous and we have a lot of ideas. Some of those ideas percolate up and those, and those ideas are used. But we're not, I think it's overstated the, the, to the extent that we might be influential on a on, on a on some level of government. You know, I don't think that is uh, that that that's an overstatement. Uh, we have no ability to uh, in that way at all. Uh, we we can make uh, so a few suggestions here and there, but um, we we don't really uh, you know we're we're famous. I would say uh, that's that's the extent of our of our influence. Yeah. Although I will say Stacy has made her, her mission to to keep the scammers out of the country and, and obviously you, you know, supporting her in that. So it's um, but I, I definitely understand what you're saying. You're not the ones calling the shots or telling what the government what to do. You're helping connect them with with people. And, and when they solicit advice, give them, hey, be careful of this thing or that. But not the ones that's, you know, sometimes people think that you guys are behind the scenes, like pulling all the strings, which is, is silly if you understand how governments work. But no, it's yeah. like it's absurd, really. Uh, we uh, we just happen to be very charming, uh, and I think <laughs> they mistake that for some kind of huge, you know, Machiavellian power play. It's like I have great legs, and uh, you know, I'm a charming guy. I guess you could say I'll, I'll say that, and uh, that's about uh, that's about it, really. We have a lot of ideas, and those ideas, uh, a couple of them have you know percolated up to the top, and. Um, you know, things happen like the, 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 the need to be more active in discouraging anything but Bitcoin is certainly something that we believe in and have worked and endeavored uh, the both of us to uh, make to try to get that going. And as a result of the past year, there's been none of these scams and scandals have happened really in El Salvador. And I think both Max and Stacy. Uh, you know, we look, we see that and we're saying to whatever extent we had in, in this outcome, uh, we're very happy that we were able to help get, achieve this outcome. Um, and so, and the, the country has benefited. And since I live here, I want to live in a Bitcoin maximalist country. I don't want to, I don't want to live in a country with a lot of these other garbage projects. Yeah. Uh, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the place I want I want to live in. Well, and that goes along with the Bitcoin ethos of, you know, it's 
I, all these efforts are decentralized and people are playing different roles in different ways. It's not all top down. And so when people, it's funny because people bring criticism. Well, what about this? What about, I mean, I had the other day, somebody write me like, well, you guys aren't really doing anything else, Zante, because there's no hospitals yet and not everybody has water. I'm like, we're doing some educational programs. We're not the government. <laughs> if you want to build a hospital, build a hospital. But why did that become my responsibility? But it's funny because people always look at, well, but what about, but what about, but what about? It's like, do it. Go for it. Well, you know, on social media, it's very random and people say random things yeah. and they're typically coming from a place of low or no information. So I, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, as I was saying earlier, the amount of stuff, the, the, where the president has been able to take the country during his presidency. Um, and I think the most relevant statistic would be from going from the highest crime homicide rate in the world to virtually down into the single digits, you know, safer than Canada. Yeah. I mean, that is something that is a remarkable. Everybody said that was impossible. They All, said that, they was, said impossible. that was impossible. It never happened. And now they're criticizing the way he did it. So it's like you can't win. Well, I mean, to your point about the other things on the agenda to do, like, there, that was something that when you when you do this and make that a priority, it has a huge multiplying effect. Remember, the gangs were extorting six billion dollars a year. So now that six billion dollars that was being extorted by the gangs is going right back into the economy. And it was a 28 to 29 billion dollar economy. That's a 20 percent boost to the economy by just getting rid of uh, those gangs. So then all the, the small business owners, like there's 5,000 pupusa sellers on the street. Suddenly, instead of giving, forking over 20 or 30 or 40 or 50% of their daily take to the gangs, that's all going back into their pocket. They can then offer a better product. They can hire somebody. They can expand and multiply that times a million or 2 million in, in the economy. And you have this entrepreneurial uh, exponential growth. You have then this uh, GDP growing, you have tourism growing, the um, Norwegian cruise lines, they sent one cruise line here a few months ago. Uh, they hadn't in years because of the violence problem. They sent the cruise line, it went great. Now they're gonna send eight cruise lines, you know, eight cruise, these huge cruisers with two, 2,500, 2,000, 2,500 passengers. They're, they come with a lot of tourist dollars. That's a big economic boost. Um, you, and it's not just what they spend at that time. It's that then they see El Salvador and they can go back and tell everybody that's very different than what the media is saying. Yeah, exactly. It's beautiful country. Then you have people in the States who are moving back. Um, you know, there's potentially of the 3 million or so Salvadorans that live in the United States. Uh, now you've got the reverse. You know, they're coming back to El Salvador. They want to be back in the country that they know that they grew up in, that they were born in, that they're maybe their the parents were born, and they're they're bringing in uh, a lot of uh, experience, entrepreneurial experience, and money. Right. So now that they, I believe, there's an idea that you we can get five hundred thousand uh, Salvadorans living in the United States coming back into El Salvador. Then now that's that's a lot of money. Now you, the GDP, if you take in the tourism boost. The, what's happening with Bitcoin to boost the economy, plus the uh, returning Salvadorans coming back, uh, plus other aspects. You know, suddenly you get go from a 28, 29 billion dollar economy. You're talking now within five or six years to a 60 billion dollar yeah. economy. As you mentioned earlier, they've paid down a lot of their debt. Uh, I think they're going to be paying down uh, uh, more debt. I mean, that's definitely a goal is to 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 whittle down, whittle the debt down. Tax uh, revenues are up without raising taxes just because right. the well, minister, economy is minister, stronger. Minister Zelaya, who, who I mentioned earlier, yeah. is, you know, personally a guy who I really uh, love in a big way. And, um, you know, he goes on TV every Thursday night and shames people to pay their taxes, like big industrialists who maybe are not paying all their taxes. Yeah. And, historically here, if you were one, one of the protected families, right. you just didn't pay taxes. Right. So he goes on TV and he, it's like a, the worst game show ever invented <laughs> where the minister of finance goes on TV and says, Hey, you know, you're, you're this huge corporation, you know, and you haven't paid this tax, you owe this tax and it works. So their tax revenues are up like 15%, but they didn't raise taxes. They didn't raise that. Cause that's, that's right. for, for tax system to be fair, it needs to be Taxes low, but broadly collected, not, right. you know, those who are privileged, not paying and everybody else having to pay double because of that. Right. And and if you look also, there was in the, the city of Soyapongo, uh, there was a bit of a scandal where the mayor was uh, not behaving as scrupulously as you would want the mayor to behave. So the government was like, hey, you know, we're going to uh, replace this mayor because we we have a zero tolerance for any corruption. And I think that mayor was from the president's party, correct? Like they replaced one of their own? 
I don't know that detail. I, I think I, if I remember right. It was it was it wasn't like, hey, you're exempt because you're part of our party. It There's was, nobody is exempt. Yeah, no, nobody is exempt. Uh, everybody uh, and and the the quid pro quo is is that we're going to bring fairness across the board and we're going to get rid of the gangs. Obviously, uh, we're going to have Bitcoin as legal tender. And there's a huge benefits uh, in that that can be applied across the economy. And uh, we're going to uh, make it so that you are finally able uh, to enjoy freedom, economic freedom in a way that other, most other countries, if not any other, no other country has the same economic freedom as El Salvador at this point. I call it the new shining city on the hill, which is something that Ronald Reagan talked about in the 1980s as America yeah. it being irreplaceable as being the one uh, indispensable country on earth. I think that title is now with El Salvador. I think El Salvador is now the one, the single only indispensable unique country on planet earth that the world needs now that uh, is irreplaceable, that nobody else comes close because of both just historical um, coincidences or, if, and, and plus Bitcoin plus Bukele, it's just, everything came together. And now, uh, it, this is, this is where we're at. This is what, this is why we're here. You know, you feel the excitement, you feel the, the, the people have a sense of liberation. Like it's almost like the vic after uh, victory in Europe day, and those images of people on the street kissing and whooping it up and having a great time. This is yeah. like almost what you have here. People are liberal, literally free for the first time ever. Uh, I saw a comment from a Salvadoran who said he's living in a place like uh, um, uh, um, Soyapongo or um, Ilopongo. And he was saying that um, he his house is too big now. And what he meant was that up until just recently, he, uh, he, he his wife and his kids never left the house because it was too dangerous. Yeah. And now suddenly everyone's out of the house because it's that's not dangerous. And he's like, I have, my house is too big. I don't need this big house because no, nobody's here anymore. They're outside. They're interacting. They're communicating. And think about the benefits you have when people can freely meet. It's like, oh, you know, like some younger Salvadorans, they meet in this and they're saying, hey, you know, we, why don't we start a, a business? You know, why don't we do something together? And we're free to do that. We have the ability. And so that just has that exponential effect, yeah. uh, which you had in the United States, of course, was the home of that type of of, of uh, growth of that type of environment uh, for for many years, and it gave us um, an economic standard that was world beating and set the standard for the world. Uh, and now, it seemingly, I would I don't think it's a big secret that they're having troubles in the United States, particularly in the finance sector and the banking sector. And uh, so, people are looking at the model of what I call Bukelianomics. There is something you could say called Bukelianomics. Bukelianomics, right? So this is his program. This is his idea of economic freedom, where you know you get rid of the gangs, you do f uh, fair taxes, and um, you implement this program. And the the effect is is growth, uh, but in a, but not growth at any expense. It's growth that's uh, more holistic. Yeah, growth that is uh, includes the people, it's the average people. Growth. Um, and, um, it's still, it still encourages entrepreneurialism and it's still capitalism. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not, and, and, uh, but it's done in, it's done in a way that, uh, everybody has a sense that we're on a level playing field to use something that you said earlier. I think there really is that sense that people feel that, that you would have in the United States of anybody can make it. Um, you know, this is the mythology of the United States, but it's be, it's being destroyed by. The, and it used to be like that. It used to be like that, but the kleptocracy, the uh, political interest, special interest groups, etc., have made the U.S. more of a class-driven society. It's, it's actually more like Great Britain, which is a very class-driven society, uh, very very strict class uh, divisions in in the United Kingdom really prevent a lot of social mobility, even to the point where if you have the wrong accent. You know your chances of becoming successful and uh, are are limited unless you know how to be in a, a band, you know, <laughs> and, or some or an entertainer of yeah. sorts. I mean, you can't really climb the social ladder in Britain if you have the wrong accent, right? That it's, it's very very strict in that sense. The people who know live there would know what I'm saying. But in in America, it's the melting pot. You know, anyone can make it. It's American, not Americant. Uh, but a lot of that is is being lost. And where you find it is in El Salvador. You know, the, the idea of that, 
American entrepreneurialism and freedom is a, it's an idea. It's not, it, it, and that idea can travel anywhere in the world and we find it right here. So this is, this is what I enjoy. This is what's pulling me here. This is why we're here. What would you say um, to the degree that El Salvador has been successful in, in creating a, a circular Bitcoin economy? That's something for so Bitcoin Beach that that's very important that we don't have to worry about things like Silicon Valley Bank because we're not dealing with the banking system. Obviously, that's a long term process to make Bitcoin um, not have to interact with the fiat system. And we hear some criticism from people to say, no, you're not really creating a circular Bitcoin economy. Other people come here and they live only on Bitcoin. What's kind of your perspective? How far do you think we have to go on that? And what do you think are the stages that that'll go through? Well, you're the king of a circular Bitcoin economy here in Bitcoin Beach, right? This is really where it started uh, with the gift, I guess, that goes back a few years to get the economy in El Zante into a circular Bitcoin economy. And that was the model, in fact, that caught the attention of the president in which kind of pushed the idea of making Bitcoin legal tender along. So we know that it works in an area, in this area. The question is, can it go, can it become a regional and a national circular economy? And this is the path of Bitcoin to becoming a um, standard, a unit of account, yeah. right? So with Bitcoin, and, and, and all money, uh, it starts off as a um, collectible, then it moves into a store of value, then it goes into medium of exchange, then it becomes unit of account. So with Bitcoin, ten, when I started, it was, you could say it was more in the collectible stage. Um, and then it moves into the store of value stage. And certainly people like Michael Saylor would tell you why they have their cash parked in, in Bitcoin because it's protection against the melting ice cube of inflation. That's an argument of Bitcoin as store of value. Uh, despite the volatility, it's still over any three or four year period, your, your purchasing power in Bitcoin kills all fiat money and, and gold, right? It's, it's proven itself yeah. as a store of value. So here in El, in El Zante and, and in El Salvador, it's already made the leap into medium of exchange because the president made Bitcoin legal tender. Uh, because of Max and Stacey and <clears throat> other media and the, the legalization of Bitcoin, I guess you could say, it's an odd way to phrase it, but um, it be, the awareness of Bitcoin is 100%. So everyone in this country has heard of Bitcoin, uh, which is the first step toward adoption. And then actual adoption, I think, is in what the number I hear, you know, 10%, let's say. Uh, but when you have 100% awareness of this, it's just a matter of um, that awareness growing into using it. And that usually takes three or four years or, or four years. I think the cell phone penetration in El Salvador is roughly 50%. So, I mean, that's without a cell phone uh, or, you know, that's obviously an inhibiting factor uh, in, in adoption. But um, nevertheless, so you have um, the awareness is there. The adoption is going is going higher and um, the fallout in the fiat money world drives adoption. They always say that what drives adoption the most is panic. And as people are panicking out of Silicon Valley Bank and all these other fiat money banks and everything's happening in the fiat money world, they're looking around for alternatives. And there's only three real money in the world. One is a treasury bill, one is gold, the other is Bitcoin. And the one that's lagging, that's cheap relative to everything else that offers the most mobility, fungibility, portability, et cetera, would be Bitcoin. It's a superior form of money. So it's going to attract critical mass that's continued to attract critical mass. And then it moves from medium of exchange to unit of account, which is essentially your circular economy. So everything is priced in Bitcoin. Everything is paid in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the standard. It's a reserve standard. It could be the global reserve standard. And that's essentially what a circular economy yeah. is. So, and that's the full stages of money. We have a US dollar standard, which is a unit of account. The problem is that it loses purchasing power. It's guaranteed to lose purchasing power over time. Any fiat money, any paper money is guaranteed to lose purchasing power over time. And over the past 300 years, no paper money has ever not lost between 98 and 100% of its purchasing power. And they all effectively go to zero uh, over time. And that's the history of paper money. And it's never going to stop. The US dollar is now losing purchasing power all over the world. And there's a huge problem there. Uh, with gold, it will maintain its purchasing power over history. You know, a suit in, in in ancient Rome would cost maybe one ounce of gold. And in 2023, the price of a nice suit might be one ounce of yeah. gold, $1,900. So it's maintained its purchasing power. So what about Bitcoin? Bitcoin is mathematically guaranteed to increase its purchasing power over fiat money and gold 
without any equivocation on that point. There's no question that that is absolutely the case because it's absolutely fixed at 21 million coins and the adoption versus the other um, alternatives are clearly superior. And what makes money money is what is the people who use the money. This is what money is. If people use it as money, this could be money. Anything can be money, but um, it's a competition to see what people are going to use yeah, what's the best for money? money. And over, we went from shells, we went beads, gold became the standard of money for a long, long time because it had, you know, going back to Aristotle who said it had all these great attributes. Now in, as I said before, play back the tape to minute 17, that uh, <laughs> the, uh, the P Bitcoin offers uh, everything gold was doing, but on a, on as, as better, uh, in a digital age, the, the transformation through software finally arrived in the, the world of money, and we gave us a uh, Bitcoin, which is arguably perfect money. Um, and it, another argument why the twenty or thirty thousand shit coins never have uh, any chance of succeeding because they're trying to compete with perfection. Yeah. So when Bitcoin was birthed, it was perfect. So there's no need to try to beat it because it was born perfect. So, and, and what we've seen since the last 10, 11 years is all, every single one of these 20 or 30,000 altcoins has failed miserably because they're competing with perfection. And uh, you, you, can't, you can't compete with perfection. Perfection means perfection. There's nothing any of these coins do that could be in any way uh, construed as being superior to something that was born uh, uh, in its state of perfection as Bitcoin is. And I just would look to the market and you tell me where in the market do you see anything that's remotely uh, on the same zip code, you know, in the same universe as exist. Bitcoin. And there's, there's just nothing yeah. there. And so they say, well, something new could come along. And um, again, you know, it's already perfect. Yeah. You know, this is, uh, you know, like 5,000 years ago, some guy came up with the wheel, you know, it's like, Here's the wheel, you know, for, for those at home who, who have losing eyesight, like I do, you know, make it in a bigger, a bigger magic marker. Here's the wheel. Okay. Now this basic design, you know, is perfect. There's nothing. Okay. That's yeah. it. That's the wheel. Uh, no one's improved on it. Uh, it's, this is Bitcoin is like this. It's like, this is actually a stroke of genius. It does exactly what it should do. It's a perfect store of value. It's perfect money. It's portable. It's fungible. It's divisible. It's desirable. The, the attributes of the Aristotle said would apply to gold and, and this is Bitcoin. So uh, in the case of El Salvador, uh, the president has figured out that I don't need to futz around like trying to create a monetary model and, and I don't need to try to compete with these other central banks. I don't need to have a, a deflate a, a, a inflating paper money. You know, I just I can just have Bitcoin take care of that. Yeah. You know, the, the monetary policy is dictated by Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the monetary minister ultimately at the end of the day, and it does a perfect job. You know, the emission rate is already algorithmically, uh, you know, programmed. Uh, you've got uh, the difficulty adjustment, which is the special sauce of Bitcoin. It's basically Adam Back's hash cash is the core of Bitcoin technology is Adam Back's hash cash plus the difficulty adjustment. Yeah. The, the, you put those two things together and you have uh, something that took 20 years to figure out by by the cypherpunks and, and computer uh, scientists who are looking to do this. Going, you know, as, as I said, in the 90s, I was trying to do the virtual money at that time. So for 20 years, they were looking for that uh, how to do money on in a digital world. And so in in 2008, we saw the white paper in 2009, we, the Genesis block. And now in 2023, we know we, we were on the right path because every single bank in the world and every single central bank in the world and all politicians who are lobbied by bankers in the world are putting all of their effort into trying to stop Bitcoin, which is great because it only makes the hash rate goes up and the, therefore security goes up and therefore price goes up. So yeah. Bitcoin is designed to be attacked. And they are attacking it now. And, you know, forget about price. Just look at hash rate. Look at a chart of hash rate. <clears throat> All that computational power is being thrown at yeah, the network. Just, just keeps going up. 300 up quintillion the right. calculations per yeah. second. Right. It's, uh, and so that's that's where that's the metric you got to look at. Price to volatility reflects the fact that the global financial world is fucked up. And this is true. Price discovery is in 
Bitcoin price discovery. Bitcoin price shows you how screwed up the world of finance is because it doesn't have bankers and politicians manipulating prices yeah. in a way to smooth it out, to make it look like there's no problem. Bitcoin telling you there is a problem. Like the volatility index is an index that uses on Wall Street to measure how much um, risk is in, the, in are in markets, the VIX index. And it, you know, it tends to be a little bit volatile because it's an index of volatility. Bitcoin is the ultimate volatility index. It's, but it's not, it's, that's not the thing that's volatile. It's everything outside everything of Bitcoin is, that's yeah. volatile. It's simply giving you a price signal of how volatile things are out there outside of Bitcoin because the coins come every 10 minutes. The difficulty adjustment, you know, kicks in. Uh, all the incentive models are brilliantly designed. It's the Sistine Chapel of money, right? It's all aesthetically gorgeous. It's the world that's volatile, not Bitcoin. And, uh, so this is understood by the president here in El Salvador and the benefits have been great. I mean, they, on paper, they've got an unrealized loss, let's call it, uh, what, 50 million, 60 million, but they've already booked 500 million in gains from tourism and the boost at of least, the economy. At, at least, least, right? Yeah. So that's a huge, that's a huge economic boom. Yeah. Say, would, would you put, uh, you know, any corporation would die for those type of returns. Um, and it totally rebranded the country from being the home of uh, homicides to being uh, a Bitcoin citadel nation that's uh, building, uh, growing. You know, Nike or some other huge corporation would spend more than 50 million to rebrand their, their country. They would oh, spend yeah. hundreds no, of millions to, of dollars. And to overcome all how negative their brand was before, they would have had to spend billions, billions. to do what they, I mean, it, it was really genius. The the move. I think right. that's a and it's accretive. Yeah, that's fifty million is accretive. That's fifty million is not never going to be a realized loss. They're going to keep dollar cost averaging, and it's always going to be accretive. They're yeah. always going to be making money on that position over time because the fiat money world is collapsing. It's mathematically guaranteed. So you're spending marketing dollars that are that you get paid back on. Um, so that's not even an expense. Hundred um, percent. Okay. So yeah. you add it all up, and why wouldn't you want to live here? Now, to any extent that. I say anything that trickles up and, you know, is talked about and something happens on the positive side, you know, that's great. But, you know, I'm just like living here and breathing here and being part of this revolution. I think that's a good uh, note to wind uh, up on. Would love to uh, circle back in a few months because there's always exciting things happening, new things going here. But uh, what what products or, or projects or things do you want people to make sure they know about? I know you mentioned Swan earlier. I don't know if there's any other, uh, your, your Twitter handle, uh, yeah. your guys' YouTube channel. What well, should people be watching here. for? You know, our podcast here, Orange Pill Podcast. So Orange Pill Podcast has a Twitter handle. We have our YouTube channel, Orange Pill Podcast. So um, we do that once a week right now. We do it okay. in city. And it's a, uh, we've always done two forms of content over the years. One has been like a Kaiser report, which is a scripted version, uh, more or less. And then our uh, other radio type programs or podcasting is really more of an unscripted podcast like radio format. And we've been doing either one for years. So our Orange Pill podcast is really more of that unscripted uh, version of, of what of our content of what we do. And um, so um, we are settled into this new studio in the city. Uh, and, and we're, we're doing, uh, one a week and right now, so we've still, you know, we've, we're, we're keeping the, the content side of things, you know, humming along. Yeah, um, fresh. I would like to see my, you know, over the next a few months, you know, I'd like to see more push in, into that because, uh, I think it, it does a great, great job in, you know, communicating people watch that and they see really Max and Stacy raw you know they see they see us they we know that they like to watch us they like to listen to us and they know that we're here and it gets them thinking well maybe we should come here so i think there's a big value in that and i know the president's a big fan um he said that he likes the chemistry between max and stacy and he's he's been listening to our show for years so he he loves the show no your guys friendship and relationship comes through in both in person but also you yeah. know, uh, in the recording. So, yeah. yeah. No, so, so, uh, we have a lot big fan base here. So, you know, I want to make sure that they get their fix yeah. of their Max and Stacy fix, you know, at the end of the day, that's ultimately what we're, what we're known for. And I would posit that it's the quintessential expression of our uh, affection for what's happening here is through that medium. 
is is what I would say. But yeah. you know, I'm known as the poet of the of the duo, so I, I would use that in, in that poetic phrase, phraseology. No, I like that. <laughs> I like that, and it's fitting for what you guys do. So, well, thanks, Max. I appreciate you uh, spending uh, this beautiful day. It's beautiful outside. I can see the waves out there. So yeah. I appreciate you taking some time out of this beautiful day to sit here in the podcast studio. But I think it's important for people to hear your perspective and to hear what's really happening here in El Salvador. So thank Yeah, well, you. the coffee wore off about half an hour ago. So <laughs> yeah, I'm surely struggling at this point to uh, keep, stay, stay coherent. You know, it's, I may start speaking in tongues soon. But anyway, Michael, thank you for having me. And I you know this is a great uh, podcast you've got set up down here. And uh, I thank you for everything you do. You know, you, when people come, like we, when we come here, you're one of the first people really to one, you know, to, to get to know, to kind of learn the ropes a little bit and show us the way. And you've been so generous. And the people in this community have been incredibly generous with us. And um, uh, Jimbetta and, and the Hope House people have really made us part yeah. of the family. This is one of the 20 families we've been, we've been made a part of is this family. And I really appreciate it uh, from the bottom of my heart because I, I really do feel the love. And um, I just uh, wanted to thank you. No, it's been, it's been our pleasure. I mean, it's, it's always interesting when you get to know people that are kind of personalities, like, is there really something, is there, there, there. And sometimes <laughs> it's just all show, but with you guys, it's, you know, it's just, you're, you're real people. You really have a heart for what's happening here and you're willing to invest time into what's happening. And so for me, it's been a privilege to, to get to know you guys. So thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. All right. So we'll do this again in a few months. Oh, definitely. All right.